If you would, um, well, you can either turn in your Bibles to Mark 14 or follow it on the screen behind me. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 21. Verses 17 through 21 of Mark 14. And again, we're just zeroing in on one part of this passage, and that is what Jesus had to say about the one who was going to betray him. Let me read that text for you. Mark 14, beginning in verse 17. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. As they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, Surely not I. And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. But the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Well, we come now to the celebration of our Lord's final Passover on earth, to a conversation which our Lord had with his disciples just before the institution of the Lord's Supper. Now, at this point, the Passover lamb has already been slain and prepared. And of course, you know, that was picturing how Jesus was about to lay down his life for all who would trust in him. The wine was already mixed with the bitter herbs and set on the table to picture how the Lord Jesus would shed his blood, how it would be poured out to atone for the sins of those who would trust him to remove their guilt. That's very important because we're going to see when we ask the question, who is it that God is going to send to help? It is those who are guilty. Jesus' blood was shed to remove guilt. Well, now that everything was ready, Jesus sat down to eat with the twelve. And as they were eating, Jesus told his disciples that one of them, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now, it's interesting that when Jesus said this to his disciples, that they didn't begin looking at each other, asking Jesus, Lord, is it him? Is it him? Is it that one? Is it that one? But rather, knowing their own hearts and knowing what it was they were capable of doing, but by the grace of God, they were grieved and began asking him the question one by one, surely it is not I. The scripture says, let him who stands take heed that he does not fall. When you become so puffed up, as it were, in your pride that you don't think that you're capable of sinning, you're the one most likely to sin. Disciples understood something about the deceitfulness of their hearts, and so they asked the right question. Surely it's not me, is it, Lord? It's not I. Jesus said it was one who was present at the table with him, one who was dipping his bread in the same bowl that he was. Now, they did not know who he was speaking of or with whom he was speaking. We know it was Judas because, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, Judas had already gone out to the chief priests and the scribes, and he had struck a deal with them, sold out the Lord Jesus Christ for money. Remember, the chief priests were looking for an opportunity to seized Jesus and to put him to death, but not in front of the people because they were afraid of the people. And Judas, was, he was upset because the perfume that the woman, in his estimation, wasted upon Jesus Christ could have been sold, put into the money bag, and he could have taken the money, as he was often doing. Well, the situation worked out. For Judas to get his money and for the chief priests and scribes to get their opportunity, Judas was the one who was going to betray him. Now, again... Remember that this was happening because this was a part of God's plan. The scripture had to be fulfilled. What God said would happen must happen. Jesus must be betrayed. And he must be betrayed by someone close to him. David wrote in the Psalms, and you know King David lived many centuries before our Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. Many of the things that David wrote were certainly prophetic, and all of it, at least with regard to the Psalms, was the Word of God, or is the Word of God. David wrote in Psalm 41.9, 
even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. By the way, Jesus never trusted Judas in the sense this might lead you to believe he did because uh, he knew from the beginning, have I not chosen you the twelve, but one of you is a devil. Jesus knew who it was that was going to betray him at all times. But rather, Judas was entrusted with uh, certain things, not, not only the, the gifts that the Lord had given to him to minister the word and to perform miracles and even to raise the dead, but also he was entrusted with the money bag. This is not the kind of trust that might lead you to believe. And then in Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14, David writes, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, that I could hide myself from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, and my familiar friend. We who had sweet fellowship together walked in the house of God in the throng. Again, one of his close associates, one of his own disciples, was the one who was going to betray him. But again, this is how Jesus would be handed over to the Jews so that the Jews might deliver him to the Romans, that Jesus might die for his people. But now what about the one who would betray him? Was Judas excusable because this was a part of God's plan? Did God force Judas to betray Jesus? Well, we know from Scripture that he did not do this. Uh, he did this, that is, Judas did what he did because this is what he wanted to do. He wanted money. And so he was culpable. And yet, in doing what he did, he was doing precisely what God had planned that he would. Now, we saw recently that God is in control of all things. Jesus is the one, as we saw, who upholds all things by the word of his power, which means that he not only keeps everything in existence, but he is the one who is moving history along according to God's plan. But he does it in such a way that he never does violence to the will of any of his creatures. God does not force anyone to do anything against their will. Judas betrayed Jesus because he wanted the money. It's just plain and simple. And because he betrayed him, there would be severe consequences. Jesus says, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. We've already seen this idea of woe before, and I don't think we understand it as 21st century uh, you know, Western civilization, Americans and so forth. Woe literally means how horrible it will be. In this case, how terrible, what Jesus is saying is this, how terrible God's retribution will be for that one who betrays him. Now, just how horrible would it be? Well, Jesus gives us an indication when he says this. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. It would be better for him never to have existed than living and betraying Jesus Christ and now having to face God's judgment for all eternity. Well, that brings us to the doctrine that we're looking at this morning, teaching scripture of hell. And I want us to see five things this morning, all of which are very, very important. And I hope the Lord will impress these things upon our hearts. First of all, that hell is a real place. Secondly, that hell is a place of torment and suffering. Thirdly, that this suffering and torment of hell is not something that just goes on for a short time or even just a long time, but forever. I want us to see, fourthly, who it is the Bible says actually is going to go there. And then lastly, how you can escape hell, if you haven't already, through Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, let's consider that hell is real. Now, we know it's real because God says it's real. Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be betrayed. And that is exactly what took place. As a matter of fact, he told us, as we've already seen from these quotes from the Old Testament, that this was going to take place long before it happened. 
But the reason why the Lord tells us things like this, why he predicts events that are going to take place hundreds of years in the future, is so that when those things take place, that they would know, the people who see it taking place, that God is the one who said it. Because he's the only one who can predict the future. As you've already seen, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of the future. He is the one who is directing all things according to the will of God, which is why, of course, the Lord knows what's going to take place because he knows what he has planned to do. But when we see the Lord predicting the future and we see those things actually taking place, we have a very powerful argument that the Bible is the word of God. Now, because the Bible is his word, we know that whatever God says in his word is true because God never lies. And the Bible says, God tells us in his word that hell is real. Now, we've already seen several examples of that as we've been going through the service. We saw in our meditation, John the Baptist proclaiming that when Jesus Christ arrived, that he would thoroughly uh, clear his threshing floor that he would winnow Israel with the gospel, that he would gather his wheat into the barn, those who believed and received him, but he would burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Those who will not receive Jesus Christ, those who would not receive him in, in those days, he would cast into hell. Now, Jesus himself also spoke of hell as a real place. We saw that in our reading our scripture reading this morning in Matthew 18, 8 through 9, Jesus says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. On the day of judgment, Jesus is going to say to the goats, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, God has told us in his word that hell is real, and God does not lie. If you reject this truth, you do so at your own peril. But you know, for those who don't have the word of God, God has also shown us in another way that hell actually exists. God has given to us a conscience. A conscience tells us when we've done something right, but especially when we've done something wrong. It reminds us that we are accountable to someone for the things that we do. And it also reminds us through that feeling of guilt and condemnation that God's going to hold us accountable for what we've done. And if we don't find a way to get rid of this guilt, that he is going to punish us. We may not know exactly how, but we do know that he will. The Bible says that punishment is hell, and it's much worse than we can possibly imagine. Now, that brings us to the second point. We know from Scripture that hell is real, but what is hell like? Well, consider what we've already seen. John describes it as unquenchable fire. Jesus calls it the eternal fire. Uh, whatever it is, it's something like fire. By the way, for those of you who have an experience with fire, you know that fire has the potential to cause a great deal of pain. The Lord is telling us that hell is a place of great pain. Now, is hell a literal fire? Well, probably not at the, at the present time, because right now, before the resurrection, when a soul is cast into hell, it's only the soul that goes there. We know the body remains on earth. But whatever this fire is, it acts on the soul like fire does on the body, creating excruciating pain. You know, we often uh, see hell portrayed, and maybe you have in the past through maybe short stories or longer stories or maybe things on television. Hell is uh, where people can indulge in their sins and heaven is kind of a boring place. Or hell is a place where you, know, you might be able to do something that's not so terrible but because it's so boring it drives you nuts. People who are in hell only wish hell 
was like that. That's not what the Bible says. John says in Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Jesus said of the rich man after he died, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. The Bible describes hell as fire. It describes hell as torment. It is not a place that is in any way like we've seen it portrayed, unless you've seen it portrayed as this. Now, why is hell a place of torment? Why is it a place of comfort? Well, because those who are sent to hell are being punished for their sins. God is just, the Bible says. God cannot overlook sin. Every time we break His commandments, every time we offend Him, every time we sin against others, we become indebted to the justice of God. And because God is just and because He is infinitely so, God must balance the books. Every wrong thing that we do has to be punished. It's the only right thing to do. God will always do what is right. Paul writes this in Romans 2, verses 4 through 8, with regard to God's justice. Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. To, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, he will give wrath and indignation. God punishes the wicked in hell. That's what hell is all about. Punishment for sin. Now I want you to notice something else, that it is God who is punishing the wicked in hell, who justly sends the unrepentant to hell. Jesus will say to the wicked on the day of judgment, and we've already seen, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. Jesus is the one who passes judgment on them. Jesus is the one who sends them out of his presence. He's the one who puts them there, and he is the one who punishes them there. But remember, it's because of their sins. They're being punished for their sins. It's not because Jesus put them there. You know, oftentimes we think that it's wrong to punish people for the things that they do. As, as children, when we're disciplined, we think it's unjust for our parents to, to discipline us for something. At least in that case, it's, you know, it's a loving thing. But some, even today, as we look at, at the court situation, somebody murders somebody, and then as the judge is, is you know, very infrequently is going to enact a just punishment, people are in an uproar. It's not just. It's wrong to take this person's life for killing this other person. It, it, so they cry out about this injustice, but it's not injustice. That's what the person deserves for taking a life. What does a person deserve who sins against God and does not repent and who is guilty of these crimes? They deserve punishment, punishment in hell. Now, there are people who believe that hell is really the absence of God that God doesn't really send anybody to hell. It's something that people choose to do. They just sort of walk in there by themselves, but he has nothing to do on it. It's sort of a hands-off policy. He really loves everyone and wants everyone to go to heaven, but not everybody is going to listen to him and follow him, and they just kind of go that way by their own accord. You need to realize God is the one who sends them there justly for their sins. Hell is not the absence of God. It's not something that's taking place outside of his will, but something that is a part of his will. And far from being, from God being absent there, God is actually present there. Hell is not the absence of God. Hell is the presence of God. Hell is God's burning anger 
not only against sin, but against the sinners who commit the sin and who have not repented. Again, Jonathan Edwards once said, God is the fire that burns in hell. People are not suffering outside of God's will. They are suffering because that is God's will. But they suffer for their sins and their unwillingness to repent. So hell is real. And hell is a place of suffering. But now how long do those in hell have to suffer? The Bible says they must suffer forever. Jesus said that this fire is eternal. This fire, actually John said this, I think. The fire is eternal. The fire is unquenchable, both Jesus and John. The Apostle John tells us the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. The Bible says that those who go into hell never come out. They're being punished for crimes that they have committed against one who is so infinitely holy that there is no way that any creature could possibly suffer enough to satisfy for even one sin that they have committed against him, not to mention all the sins that they have committed against him. And that's why hell is eternal. That's why the suffering never ends. Well, some people, you know, just can't deal with that. They just can't imagine a God of infinite love could possibly send somebody to hell and make them suffer forever, so they come up with a doctrine that makes them more comfortable with that, called annihilationism. The idea that when God casts a soul into hell, that that soul immediately just burns up and is gone forever. And doesn't God's mercy dictate that he couldn't allow any of his creatures to suffer to such a grief forever? Well, let's think about that for a moment. Is that what the Bible says? No, he says in the Bible that they do, in fact, suffer forever. But secondly, consider this, that if all of these who were cast into hell were annihilated, then they really wouldn't suffer at all. There would be no punishment for their sins. If you don't exist, how can you pay for your crimes? If you can no longer pay for your crimes, then what does that say about the justice of God? We're going to see in a moment that God, if he is to show mercy to anyone, has to satisfy his justice before he can. That's the reason why he sent his son into the world to suffer on the cross and to endure his wrath so that his justice could be satisfied so that God may show mercy. God's justice cannot allow anyone to escape. And so one who goes into hell must stay in hell until they have paid the very last cent of their debt. But since no one can ever pay it, no one ever comes out. Now with regard again to annihilationism, notice what Jesus said about the one who was about to betray him. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Now if annihilationism was true, Jesus could not have said this regarding Judas because what's the difference? between a person who was annihilated and a person who was never born. There's really no difference, is there? In both cases, they don't exist. But he says it would be better that he had never been born because of the eternity of suffering that he is going to have to endure for his betrayal. Those who are in hell and those who will go to hell in the future will certainly wish that they had never been born, especially when you consider that the sufferings of hell go on forever. Now again, hell is a real place. Hell is a place of torment. And hell is something that goes on forever. I don't want to miss this. Maybe you saw the quote by Thomas Watson on the board. He says this, the torments of hell abide forever. If all the earth and sea were sand, and every thousand years a bird should come and take away one grain of this sand, it would be a long time before that vast heap of sand was empty. Yet if after all that time the damned may come out of hell 
there would be some hope. But this word, ever, breaks the heart. The suffering is bad enough, even if you should have to endure it for a year or ten years or even a thousand years. We need to realize that hell is something that goes on forever because no one can satisfy the crimes they have committed against God by any amount of suffering that they might possibly do. The only one who can, of course, is Jesus Christ. We're going to get to that in a moment. So hell is real. Hell is a place of suffering. Hell goes on forever. Fourthly, whom does the Lord send to hell? He sends there everyone who is guilty. But who's guilty? The Bible says everyone is guilty. Paul writes, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He writes, there is none righteous, not even one. The Bible says that every single one of us came into the world guilty. David wrote in Psalm 51, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. By the way, David was not unique in that. He was describing not only himself, but the whole human race. Paul says we all came into the world spiritually dead. We all came into the world under God's wrath. We all came into the world at war with God, and God was at war with us. Now, Judas was singled out at the Passover meal because of what he was about to do. At least he wasn't singled out by name, but he was by implication. Because he was about to do the most despicable thing that could be done, to betray the one who actually came into the world to save those who would trust in him from this hell that we're talking about. But Jesus did not mean to imply that Judas would be by himself in hell. Everybody comes into this world guilty and deserving of hell. Each person who has ever lived deserves hell over and over again for every single sin that we commit. Now we, you know that you and I, we've done this. We have sinned against God. We were guilty of Adam's sin. We came into the world with a heart disposed against God, and God looks at that as sin. All throughout our lives, we have done things that are offensive to God, even when we've done good things because we've never done them with a whole heart for God's glory or out of love for Him. All we've done is sin. And if we die in our sins, we will go to hell. The Lord will send us there and remain in absolute torment forever. So who is it go that goes to hell? The person who is guilty goes to hell. And all of us are guilty. So then we come to the final and the most important question, and that is, how can you escape hell? Well, we've already seen that once you are in hell, there is no way out. To escape it, you have to avoid it to begin with. But how can you avoid it? Well, there's really only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who can save you from hell. There is no other way. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Peter preached before the leaders of Israel in Acts 4, 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now again, remember why the punishments of hell continue forever. It's because all the suffering that you and I could ever possibly endure could never pay for even one sin that we've committed against an infinitely holy God, the only one who can make a payment that is great enough to get rid of your guilt, to satisfy justice on your account, is God himself. And that's exactly why God, the Son of God, became a man and made the payment by going to the cross and satisfying his own justice on that cross. He is the only one who can do it because he alone is God in human flesh. Now, for you to escape hell, the only way you can avoid it, you must trust in this one, this one who is the only way, the only name under heaven. You need to trust in Jesus Christ. 
Jesus actually offers himself to everyone as a savior. Jesus is the one who commanded his disciples to take the message of what he has done to all the nations and to proclaim salvation in his name. All you have to do is receive that offer. But in order to receive it, this is what you must do. You must turn from your sins. You must trust Jesus Christ alone. And you must follow him. There is no other way. You know, it's very much in vogue today to talk about all the different religions being so many different ways by which we go to the, the, the hub that they all lead to, which is God. But the Bible says that no other religion can reconcile you with God. No other savior can save you. Jesus is the only one. He is the only name that has been given by which you must be saved. And that's because he is the only one who has made any kind of a payment and certainly the only payment which is great enough to save you. So if you would escape the consequences of your sins, what you actually and I justly deserve, which is eternal and everlasting torment and suffering in hell, you have to trust Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can save you. Perhaps through all of this, John 3.16 will make greater sense. And you'll see just how great God's love is in that he offers his son to a world that hates him, that has sinned against him, and that deserves nothing but hell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you actually trust what Jesus Christ did and trust him as your savior to save you from hell and turn from your sins, he will save you. If you haven't done that, do it now. Believe on him now. Trust in him and be safe. Again, none of us knows the time of our death. People die unexpectedly all the time. That may happen to you, it may not happen to you, but I'll tell you what, if it happens to you and you haven't trusted Jesus, you will go into hell and you will never escape. But if you trust Jesus Christ, you trust him now, if you turn from your sins, he will save you. And it doesn't matter then when you die because you will be ready to meet the Lord. The Bible says that those who trust him when they die immediately go into heaven. So you have a choice set before you this morning. Which one are you going to choose? Heaven or hell? I hope by God's grace, you choose heaven by trusting in Jesus. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that God would apply his word, that he would uh, impress it upon our hearts, that we would be able to hear it as we should and respond as we should.